looking at uh, Ruth Benedict's excerpt from her books, Patterns of Culture, uh, the editors have called this section um, cultural relativism. It's from an essay or, or a chapter of that book called Anthropology and the Abnormal, actually, which I think is something to keep in mind. Um, she read this very carefully. Um, looking it over, I was struck by how powerful a uh, presentation it really is. And the question is, um, despite its uh, really, I would say, yes, a very powerful message about the variability of culture, about the malleability of human behaviors and, and patterns of, of, of culture, um, what exactly is established about morality, which is a, a question that we need to ask. It is called anthropology and the abnormal, and it is not called uh, anthropology and moral relativity, right? There's a certain move uh, that's made at a certain point in crucial point in this text that needs to be paid very close attention. Um, she, again, it is very powerful um, and to say that she's a relativist, uh, yes, of course she is. That, that, that the relativism is the is the point. It's just a question of how much she really establishes in, in terms of moral relativism. But some of the things she says are very striking. I'm looking here on the first page of the of the excerpt uh, in the second column. She says, in the higher cultures, and by that she means the, well, maybe that higher and lower thing is a little bit outmoded, but cultures like our own, uh, she says that in the higher cultures, the standardization of custom and belief over a couple of continents, and basically she means Europe and North America, has given a false sense of the inevitability of the particular forms that have gained currency. And we need to turn to a wider survey in order to check the conclusions we hastily base upon this near universality of familiar customs. Basically saying that Western civilization is not uh, the only possibility, right? And that our own culture is not some inevitable uh, emergence or an inevitable uh, outcome of a universal human nature, but just one of what she calls a, a series of possible adjustments. And she says at the end of this uh, paragraph, modern civilization from this point of view becomes not a necessary pinnacle of human achievement, but one entry in a long series of possible adjustments. That is, we can't take for granted that the way we do things, the way we think, that our values are the only ones and the only possible ones. and. She makes this point, or she illustrates this point, by looking at uh, the some of the customs of what she would call simpler societies. Basically, uh, hunter-gatherer or small agricultural communities that are have not been influenced or shaped by these uh, by modern civilization, by modern Western civilization. And she makes some very powerful and striking uh, points about how the, as she says, the customary, modern, normal, abnormal categories, that is what is considered normal within a society and what is considered abnormal within a society really vary very, very widely. And she gives some very interesting examples. Remember, she's writing in the 1930s or 1920s, but 30s at the latest. Um, so it may be that some of her assumptions about what is considered normal in, say, modern American civilization have changed quite a bit in the 90 or 100 years since she wrote. Um, and that's, of course, true. And it's, of course, true of uh, one of her major uh, examples of the variability of the normal, abnormal categories, and that's with reference to homosexuality. Um, you know, one of her points here is that Unlike her culture, let's say North American culture of the 1930s, 
in which homosexuality, which of course existed, and of course there was a variability of opinion on it, but it was generally considered to be a deviance, uh, an abnormality, and the people who were homosexual were sort of um, put under a lot of stress. You know, I mean that they didn't their homosexuality was seen as something that didn't fit into society, and so had to be repressed or hidden or camouflaged in some way. Um, but she cites several uh, cultures, of course, ancient Greek culture, but also the cultures of the societies that she's, I suppose, been studying as an anthropologist and saying, well, there are cultures in which it's not seen as a deviance and w which at least male homosexuals have uh, a recognized place and they don't need to hide it. And, you know, to her, coming from American society, I suppose, uh, of the early 20th century, that must have come as something as, of a revelation considering how taboo homosexuality was in her society. Or she mentions other uh, types of behavior which uh, are considered taboo or bad or somehow shameful or deviant in our society, which are the common sort of outlook in other societies. Uh, one of the things she mentions is a society in which uh, suspicion, paranoia, um, a presumption that others are out to get you is seen as just a fundamental way of looking at things, a normal way of looking at things, in which somebody, in which somebody who was trusting and, and friendly and helpful would be seen as a deviant. Just to try to take these extreme examples um, to try to make the point that what we consider normal and abnormal is very plastic, very malleable, very changeable from one society to another. Uh, and that the habits, the uh, outlooks, the behaviors that are considered normal in any one society are, she says, it's sort of like the, in language, in the development of language, uh, you have to just arbitrarily select a certain number of possible phonetic articulations, as she puts it down here. I'm on page uh, 36. Um, just as there are great numbers of possible phonetic articulations, and the possibility of language depends on a selection and standardization of a few of these in order that speech communication may be possible at all, so the possibility of organized behavior of every sort from the fashions of local dress to the dicta of a people's ethics and religion depend upon a similar selection among the possible behavior traits. I guess the idea being that there's all sorts of different possibilities for human behavior and every culture starts with a fairly arbitrary selection of them and then more and more emphasizes them so that cultures diverge from each other in terms of what they consider normal more and more. But she suggested it there uh, when she mentions ethics and religion at the top because say one of the things I have in mind is this these different theses that Pojman introduces in the next essay, the weak diversity thesis and the strong diversity thesis. Um, what he points out, I think is quite true, is that you could be a relativist in a weak sense and recognize this huge diversity of possible behaviors without necessarily being a full-blown ethical relativist. And that would be the difference between the weak uh, thesis, that there are all sorts of differences between culture, which may be very important, and the strong thesis that um, morality itself depends upon these differences and, and there will actually be fundamentally different and incompatible moralities between culture, which is what he ultimately rejects. She certainly doesn't reject that. Uh, she's a full-blown relativist. And the move that I talked about earlier, uh, the important uh, point, key point in the essay is here on the same page, uh, down at the bottom of the second column where she says, uh, 
it is a point that has been made more often in relation to ethics than in relation to psychiatry. We do not any longer make the mistake of deriving the morality of our locality and decade, decade directly from the inevitable constitution of human nature. We do not elevate it to the dignity of a first principle. You might keep Thomas Aquinas in mind there. In her mind, that's the mistake that Thomas made, perhaps, was elevating the morality of his locality and, and time into something like a first principle, you know, falsely. We recognize that morality differs in every society and a convenient term and is a convenient term for socially approved habits. And there you go. There's the move that I was talking about. Um, because if you equate uh, morality with socially approved habits, as she says, mankind is always preferred to say it is morally good rather than it is habitual. And the fact of this preference is matter enough for a critical science of ethics. But historically, the two phrases are synonymous. That is something being morally good and something being habitual or socially approved. If you make that move and say that morality is what is considered, uh, what is habitual and what is socially approved. And if it's clear that what is habitual and socially approved changes from culture to culture, then clearly morality changes from culture to culture. That's why it's such an important move. The equation of um, what's socially approved with what is moral Somebody like Pogeman would say that there's, what is moral is something different from what is merely socially approved. In her radical way, Ruth Benedict denies that distinction. She continues there at the bottom of the page, the concept of the normal is properly a variant of the concept of the good. There again, the move is being made again. It is that which society has approved. So if you, she is a conventionalist when it comes to morality. Morality is what's socially approved. And if what's socially approved is open to these wide variations that she's illustrated, then what is moral is open to the same sort of variation. Uh, again, the key move is to deny that there's any distinction between the, the normal and the good. To deny that there's any distinction between what is moral or what is considered morally good and what is socially approved. That is the radical thesis. That is what makes her a cultural relativist and not just a somebody noting differences in behavior, somebody who's denying that there is such a thing as an objective morality, um, that there are only these variations. Um, that's pretty much her thesis, I think. Uh, and um, I think the, the the biggest challenge that she presents, though, I think in terms of her illustrations is what we focused on in class. Um, I'll just point it to you. I mean, uh, point it out to you. You can find it yourself. You obviously know where it is. But this reference to uh, page 35 to the Kwaki Oodle, uh, in which um, you pretty much randomly kill somebody or kill some people, a group of people, in response to the deaths of members of their own uh, community, kill some people outside their community, something that, that would generally be seen as horrific and uh, terrible and it, 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 definitely unjust because the people they killed had nothing to do with the deaths of the people who died and nor was there any pre pretense that they did. And this is explained in terms of a, a whole cultural outlook having to do with the not being uh, or, or the idea of insult and need, need to rise up and wipe out the stain of insult you can read it for yourself but the the real challenge of course is whether or not you and i reading this uh, really buy the thesis that this is merely another variation in human behavior whether this is just another adjustment um, or and as i asked you in the study questions whether we regard this as just objectively wrong and bad uh, the killing of these people. Um, of course, we could qualify and say that we consider it bad according to our standards of morality. But then the question is, can we imagine any standard of morality in which it would not be considered bad? Uh, and there we have to make certain decisions about whether we are relativists or something like objectivists. It's a key point in anybody's study of moral philosophy 
where they have to ask themselves which side of the of that division they really feel comfortable falling on. I will not. Uh, my job is not to tell you which one is correct, uh, but my job perhaps is just to point out the challenges to both sides, and, and I suppose this is this is one of the key ones. <laughs>